All right, guys, we're sitting here with Lisa Ann, iconic adult film star. She's a friend. She was a regular on Barstool Breakfast, and she's the host of Lisa Ann Does Fantasy on Sirius 210 XM 87. Did I get you that right? You got that right. Okay, great. And that's Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m., and then Monday from 10 to 12 midnight. Lisa, welcome on into Out and About. Thank you so much for having me. We've had so many great interactions over the past couple of years, and you're just a gem. <laughs> Thank you very much. So my so Lisa used to come on Barstool Breakfast, which was the show that I produced um, a couple months ago. That went off the air, and she's always stayed close with us at Barstool, so we love her very much. So my idea for this show today was just to kind of do an oral history of Lisa Ann, because everyone knows you know, who you are at the right. surface level, but I find your life and your career trajectory so fascinating that I wanted to kind of start at the very beginning and then go from there. Okay. Is anything off limits before we get there going? There is nothing off limits. Okay. So let's start. You grew up in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. Easton, actually. It's Easton. a small town about 45 minutes north of Philly, mm -hmm. and it's right below the Pocono Mountains, so like right below East Stroudsburg. It's a beautiful area. There's nothing to do. You know, when you live in an area like that, what do you do? You drive around, you smoke cigarettes, you smoke weed, <laughs> you drink. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I wasn't much of a drinker when I was a kid, but I remember getting the driver's license, and I was just, like, getting changed together. Because when I was a kid, when I started driving, gas was 90 cents a gallon. So your friends literally could all give you a handful of change, and you could fill up your gas tank. It was a different life. That's incredible. Yeah. What was your childhood like? Did you have a lot of friends growing up? Were you sporty? Were you popular like I had a lot of friends growing up I was out on my own young I was still in high school when I was out on my own so that kind of pushed me into a work mode where some of my relationships changed right so I went into a work program through high school I went to school in the morning till noon then I had to work at a dentist office I was a dental assistant uh, my last two years of high school because I wasn't emancipated so in that sense they needed me to work to stay into school but that job wasn't gonna pay me enough money right. I was a I was you know I was making maybe minimum wage which at that time was like 335 an hour um, and I had car payment I had rent so I started doing these bikini contests, and through these bikini contests, I met a girl that's like, hey, I can help you get fake ID, and then you can How start working at strip clubs. At that time, I was 16. Okay. So the bikini contest circuit is like the marijuana. It's like the gateway. Yeah. <laughs> Once you do that, you start landing in different bars, you start noticing different things, and then you're like, okay, when I first start dancing, I'm going to dance at a bikini bar, because that's like New Jersey. You can find these bikini. Right. You're not naked yet, so you haven't mm -hmm. really fully committed, but you're shaking your boobs. You take tips with your boobs at the bikini bar. Like, you do all this, and it just kind of slowly progressed, and when I was 18, I was able to actually start working at a club called Al's Diamond Cabaret in Reading, Pennsylvania, and Al had porn stars and magazine models come in every week to do shows, so to me, it was like, this, these women were traveling the world and they had these glamorous lives and they didn't have to see the same customers all the time. Because right. when you're a regular girl, it's kind of like being a waitress. You have a couple customers you really like, a couple customers you really don't like. But you have to serve them all. So I looked at these women and I thought, well, this is kind of the ideal situation with simple goals that I set once I was out on my own to keep my life very basic. I said, I want to travel and see the world. Mm -hmm. Now, as a kid, I was never on an airplane. My parents never flew us anywhere. I never even stayed at a hotel with my parents, which was normal. How did you get, uh, how did you get, why were you out on your own so early? Um, I had a back and forth with both of my parents. So my mom and dad got divorced when I was young. I lived with my mom until I was, I guess, around 12-ish. Uh, and then I went to live with my dad. And when I lived with my dad, my dad worked a lot and bartended. So he would have me either stay at a neighbor's or stay with my grandmother. So I was kind of bouncing around. I was kind of living in a bag, you know, uh, which probably made it easier for me to be on the road and, and live out of a bag again, kind of set that kind of. Yeah. But I didn't have a good relationship with my parents. My parents had a nasty divorce. Um, they were very spiteful with each other. And at the time that I was living with my dad, I didn't have any relationship with my mom at all for a, a great group of years from like 13 to say 24. Um, and then earlier in life, my dad wasn't as close with us because we were living with my mom and he was bad. So it was like this whole tug and pull. Yeah. And so me doing this, you know, it's very different when you have parents that you're worried about what they think. Absolutely. When you're not worried about what your parents think, when your parents bail on you and you know nobody can bail you out of jail, nobody can help you if you have a problem, your mindset becomes survival. Right. And so I wanted to make as much money as I could to make sure I could travel and see the world, 
be financially independent and make my own schedule. That was really it. So when you got, so you were 16 when you started doing these dance competitions. Prior to 16 when you were doing these, was there like career aspirations or were you young enough that you got into this and you said, you got to taste that money and you're like, oh fuck, this is for me. So I was huge into basketball all through high school. It's my number one sport, my favorite sport. And I played oh, all yeah. through school. And ski club. And, I, and did ski my, club. I did my research, Lisa Ann. And by the way, I still love to ski and I cannot wait. My best skiing ever was two years ago in Alaska and I can't nice. wait to go back next year and ski again. That's amazing. The snow there is so fluffy and doesn't get you wet. And I went for the first time this year in like 10 years and I ended up going four times and I loved it. Because what's weird is you think you're not going to be good at it anymore yep. and you're still good at it. And yep. you're like, oh my God, I'm so good at this. This is so <laughs> cool. I don't want to try snowboarding. No, I already that. know how to ski. Why would I do that? Yeah. So, um, and as a young, young girl, I wanted to be a sports agent. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the show Arliss? I rem vaguely. Yeah, you're too young. Yep. But there was a great show, which was very ahead of his time, because it was like Entourage, but with a different set of characters. I loved that show because actors, you know, athletes would come on. Jordan was on, Shaq was on, and they weren't like prepped like they are now. They didn't know how yeah. to give a good interview. They were awkward on camera, and it was awesome. It was like so awesome to see. There's no PR. Yeah, somebody yep. to see Jordan like looking around like, where's the camera? You know, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. <laughs> and I quickly realized there was no money for me to go to college. So that was going to be my hold up was I'm not going to start out my life in debt. And once you start stripping and making money, you forget that there's any other careers out there that matter. Because it's easy, because it's fast Cause money. Because it's easy, because it's fast money, because you always have cash. You're never yep. going to an ATM machine. Like, now I go to the ATM machine. <laughs> it makes me cry every time. I'm like, what happened to always having a garbage bag of stripper ones in my house for Did coffee you, runs? Were you making good money right away, or was there, like, a learning curve? In right away. Yeah. Because I'll say this. It was legal to strip at 16. No, I had no. to be 18. I had ID <laughs> that said I was 18. And yep. I tried to take that ID to, to Al's when I was like 17. And he's like, come back when you're really 18 and you can work here. I was like, okay, this is great. I'm going to go back here. <laughs> um, the money was great back then. Because I'm going to tell you this. When I started dancing, you got paid an hourly wage in cash. And that was anywhere from $25 to $30 an hour. Plus, you were making tips. And there weren't a ton. It wasn't cool yet. So there weren't a ton of young, hot girls or young, pretty girls. And I realized quickly, like, there were a lot of biker girls. There were a lot of rougher girls. Yeah. Like, I was, I definitely stood out. You were the gem. I was the gem. And so I was making stupid money. I mean, just money that I didn't even know what to do with. What year was this? Uh, 1988. 1988. Do you remember what, like, your first big payday was? Or do you remember what you would, what would be a good night in 1988? For Lisa Ann in, was it Easton, Pennsylvania? Easily $1,000 a night before $1, my pay. $1,000 a night. And yeah. did you, you have never had to pay taxes on that? Well, no, because they paid us cash for our, like, they didn't even have our ID. They were, yeah. like, laundering money through us. Right, now, yeah, yeah. Now, flash forward to when I'm 18, I go to Al's. Al's explains, I will pay you. You will get $25 an hour, but you will get a check, and I will have an accountant come in and make sure you're doing your taxes. Al was my first step in legitimizing what I was choosing to do for a living, and Al was also a big help for me to become a feature dancer. His best friend, Tony Lee, was the biggest feature dancer in the industry, and Al kind of trained me to work really hard. For Al, you had to work six days a week. That's it. You could Al, not. And he owned Al. Owned Al's strip club. Al owned Al's. We called him the dude. Al, the Al, dude. I'm assuming Al is no longer. He's still there. He's, he's still, still alive there? and he's still amazing. And You're I love kidding. him so much. Wow. Um, you had to work six days a week, so you would work Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, either noon to six or six to midnight. And then on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you worked noon to midnight. We thought nothing of that. It was kind of yeah, that's labor. A lot. That's a lot. <laughs> that's right? a long hour. But so, you're not dancing the whole time, right? No, you you're going up once an hour. Okay. So you get the breaks in the back. And I'll tell you, it's funny about back then. We didn't have lockers in the dressing room. Nobody stole from anybody. Most of the girls would sit in the back and read books. I was such a yeah. different world. Now when I go to the clubs, the girls are drinking and partying. That was never the case. The girls yep. may have smoked cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, but nobody partied. Did Al you did smoke? not. Back then, yes. Of course. When did you quit smoking? I quit smoking when I started doing radio full time in 2013. Oh, so you smoked for a while. I smoke. I could still smoke. Are you kidding me? When I go to Italy, the first thing I do is buy a pack of cigarettes. Everybody there smokes. Just I don't want to look like a foreigner, so I'm yes. smoking. So I look Italian, okay? One of them. I still love cigarettes. I just know they're awful for you. And I've heard broadcasters that have really wheezy voices, and you could hear them breathing on air. Oh, uh, yeah. And I just didn't want that They're to be cool, me. though. Cigarettes are a cool look. No matter no matter what they say, they you look cool when you smoke a cigarette. They smell. They smell <laughs> on your hair. If you, if all of that didn't happen, so let's go back to Al's. So you would work three weeks on and one week off. 
So you'd have one week. So you're he, like a firefighter. He trained you, and he said, this is how you're going to live. You're going to work yeah. your three weeks, and in that other week, you're going to do all your personal things. You're going to handle yep. your dentist, your hair, your this, your that. And he trained me, and that's what helped me be a good feature dancer because I would do the same thing as a feature. I'd work three weeks on, one week off. What's that mean, feature dancer? Feature dancer means you get paid to go into a club and be at the event. You're a headliner. You're a headliner, yep. So you go out there and you do certain, you know, three, two or three shows a night, depending on how many nights the club wants you have. They pay your travel. When you get more popular, they pay for your roadie, your assistant's travel and hotel. Um, at first, you have to share a hotel room with your assistant, which really sucks. Usually, Male or female? Both. And, yep. you know, somebody snores. You Ugh, know what I mean? Like, yes. if there's always that. So... Al's really got me to meet all of these women. And so whoever would talk to me, I just straight up interviewed them. Yeah. And I would ask them, like, okay, is who do I not want to work for? How do I get on the box cover? How do I get a contract? What should I be doing? And I knew the look of the girls, like Ashlyn Gear, uh, Christy Canyon, Diana Loren. I knew the look of their box covers was the look of the product that I wanted to create. I'm going to date myself here. What is a box cover? A box cover is what the VHS used to be in, but now oh, we VHS call it. Oh, VHS cover. Now we okay, call it the sleeve that goes in the DVD packaging. I was packaging. almost too embarrassed. I was almost too embarrassed that I was like box cover. Box cover. So they used to film you dancing and put you on. No, this was for my movies. I was oh, interviewing this is for your these movies. women because oh, I knew. Okay, I got you. I knew I was going to get myself to California, and I knew I was going to get in the business. But it took me a good two plus years of interviewing these women to have the courage to, to put a plan the together. They also helped me write to companies. I mean, we didn't have the internet. Yeah. I had to go and hire a photographer, yeah. get the photos developed, mail them to the companies with letters, Yeah. and then wait for them to either call me, and then I'd have to be either using the calling card or a long-distance phone call. Which mm -hmm. were, you know, oh, I remember those. Yeah. It's a long time ago. And uh, eventually, it got me out to California. So let's so let's talk about that. So you, were dan you started dancing in 1988. Uh, was that yep, 1988, yep. right? You I danced graduated until, high school in 90. until 94? I continued, yes, and, but and then I continued. And then you continued throughout your career. And in 1994, you shot your first scene. I believe it was with Flesh for Fantasy. It was. Do you remember, so you wrote this company, Flesh. you wrote to Flesh for Fantasy and no, they hired you? How did I, that come about? I wrote to all of the companies. And then what ended up happening was some of the girls that I met at Al's helped me meet a man called Peter, named Peter Davey. Peter Davey was an ex exclusive like agent who would take specific girls and he would take you around to meet all of the companies and help you negotiate your contract. And then he got a little payout from the company most yep. likely, right? He never asked anything for me. He picked me up at the airport. I lived with him for a month when I first got out so there. So he was Total just an stranger. agent? Total stranger. Yeah. yeah, but he was like, didn't rep a lot of girls. He mainly got girls contracts and then moved on. Interesting. And so how did he make his money? Just off the company? He who probably was got for? money from the companies. You know, at that time I didn't even think anything of it. But he was he like a sleaze ball? Was he not like a at good all. guy? Oh, I lucked out yeah. so much. Because you probably met people who were just beyond. Right? Be yes. But we'll luckily, talk about that in a minute. But luckily, Peter Davies through was not. him, the contract that I signed helped me then go to all of these events with a company that was going to protect me and introduce me to the right people. So I got to spend two years under contract with this company, and it was Metro Home Video. They had all different lines. Flesh for Fantasy was under the Cal Vista title, and that production company sold all to cable. Because back okay. then, these companies were still relying on cable yeah. to make money. So um, Peter Davey took me around. He helped me get busy work before I shot my first movie. So... I probably shot that movie in like 1993 because back then editing and production took a lot longer because they yeah. shot on film. Uh, there was no handheld cameras yet. And there were wow. like 30 lighting people. And there was like smoke machines with a guy holding the fan. Was it – well, I want to ask you about that first scene. But was it – what's a typical contract – what was it structured like back then? So it was very specific. You would do one movie a month. And that one movie a month could be like a four-day set, but two of the days would be dialogue, and maybe two of the days would be a sex scene. They yeah. spread things out more, and they got so a crazy to me killer like, location. Right, everyone staying at hotels. It was like so much fun. But <laughs> so it was one movie a month. Then there was one day a month you shot a box cover because they didn't use a photo from on set. They wanted a specific photographer in a studio right. to shoot this. That was one day, and then they would send you on like bookstore signings. So you'd go out to different bookstores. I loved bookstore signings because you know in the in the 90s the stores were all pretty kind of sketchy yeah. you know what I mean oh, and yeah. people watching in a sex shop is like the absolute best like you know just random people coming in for different things but um 
the one specific thing I remember that I was like, two, two things that surprised me. One, we didn't do a lot of facial cum shots in the 90s. Cable didn't want to buy that. Cable still had really strict restrictions, but the companies wanted it. But the girls all got together and said, we should get paid for it. Yeah. And nobody should do more than one per contract because the girls secretly would talk. Like, we don't want this yeah, to get out of yeah. hand. You would we unionize. Don't, oh, right. It was a like secret. Yes. And so in my two and a half some years interviewing girls at Owl's, these were notes that I got. was like, right. everybody's going to want to do a facial cum shot. It's worth more money. At least get $500 more for it. So right away I knew. I was like, I want 500 more for that. They're like, all was right. Was it easy to negotiate those things? Like if you were already under contract and your contract says X, Y, Z, you're in a scene and then they try and slip something in, like a cum shot or a facial, are you like, fuck that, you need to pay me more? Or is it just like ahead of time you... Back then, nobody tried to slip anybody anything. You were right. a contract girl. You were treated like, we just don't want her to leave. You were a kept you know, girl yeah, in yeah, the Yeah, you were so kept. And remember, yep. there weren't a lot of girls flooding into the industry right. yet, right? So they were always treating you like, we, you know, craft services will call you. What specifics do you want on <laughs> nice. your food? What, you know, what, what did you get? What was I was the always like vegetables, chicken breast. Yeah. At the time, I was working with a trainer and a nutritionist, and I was trying to keep it right. You know, so vegetables, fruits. But they would keep your food separate so nobody else could have yeah. access to your food. Like, so nobody really tried that but it was my very first scene that they wanted to do the cum shot and that scene was in was flesh the flesh for, for, fan, fantasy. for fantasy that was in 1994 do you remember it specifically oh yes did you and what was that okay tell me what you remember first okay. first of all i was living in huntington beach and i was too young to get a rental car so i had to rent a rent to wreck now a rent to wreck well, is I like a rent is. okay this was a thing <laughs> this was a thing for yeah. years it's not a thing anymore a rent to wreck was a car that just barely passed inspection in California and somebody could rent it to you because you're like a minor so like your side mirrors duct taped yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You know, everything's legal. You have lights, but the thing is a piece of shit. Uh -huh. And so I never wanted to roll up on set in that vehicle. So I would always <laughs> want to drive up the day before from Huntington Beach, scope out the area, and then find a place where I'd be able to park and walk. There was no chance at this place. It was a Hollywood Hills mansion, and you had to drive up about a, a two-mile driveway to get there. So there was no me walking up this driveway. Lisa Ann comes up in the hoopty. In the hoopty, totally in the hoopty. But the house was incredible. A huge castle, this huge castle. When I got there, the director came out to get me, to give me the tour. And we walked through the house, and there's this moat, like, all the way around the house. We go over this bridge, and he says, that's where you're going to do your scene. And it was outside, which I was excited, because I love sex outside. Yep. Like, my favorite scenes have always been anything. It's a lot harder to shoot outside. I understand a lot of people don't like it, but how many people get to have sex outside? Right. And it was on this trellis, and right behind the trellis was the Hollywood sign, like larger than life. Like I could actually see how big the letters were, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I've arrived. Like this is amazing. So the excitement was so real. The guy that I worked with, Tony T. Um, That's the male actor in the scene? Yes. I gotta, uh, I'm going to look up Tony, Tony T right now as Tony you talk. Tony T. He was, a, he was a little guido, <laughs> and he was, he was aggressive. An and aggressive little guido. During the scene, he smacked me across the face. Oh. And I stopped and looked at the camera, which was a rule that everyone told me I was not allowed to do. And uh, do you see him? This little, here he is choking a girl. Exactly. <laughs> nope, that's a different Wait, Tony that's T. that's not him? No. This isn't him. So it's Tony, what was Tony's, the Tony T's a different one, but he does choke girls too. Okay. This will come to me, no, it's little, why is his name slipping I me? I feel Google so. Google, Google the cast of uh, Flesh for Fantasy. That should be easy. Oh my gosh, you guys this is open. great podcasting, right? Everyone so just sorry. Up. So anyway, um, I stopped and I looked at everybody, and then I looked at him, and, and, I, and I said, uh, "What did I do?" And he's like, "Oh, well, that's just how I like it." And I was like, "Well, that's not how I like." I had not at that yeah. time, at my age, had anyone smack me in a sexual situation. Was it hard? It was hard enough that I stopped and was like, what's that all about? Like the, right. yeah, the yeah. Northeast girl in me was like ready to beat <laughs> this guy's ass. I was like, what the fuck? So after the scene was, we're getting ready to get ready for, for the pop shot. The director comes over and he's like, okay, so this is going to be your facial. And I was like, Jay, ew, I have to have come on my face. <laughs> he tells that story to every girl that's new in the business. Because he's like, yeah, Lisa Ann didn't want come on her face either. It was just, it was my first. And I remember my... At the time, there would always be somebody from the company there with you on every set. So your person was there making sure you're – and I looked at him. I said, you guys want to use this now? Like, I got 12 scenes, to movies to make, and you want to use it? He's like, this is – it goes with the theme. So comes on my face. Goes with the theme, yeah. Oh, it comes on my face. And then after the scene, I looked at my performer, who we're going to figure out his name because I know he's a Guido, and I, I, I never have forgotten his a name Tony before. Tony Guido. That should be easy to know. Um, <laughs> and he, I looked at him. I said, well, you've just landed on my no list. 
It's the first guy I ever worked with. First guy I put on my no list. I said, No I, list is a list of performers you just say, I won't work you're with you. You're done. Yeah. Do you have a big no list? I did have a big no list. I did. You don't anymore. Well, I did. But if I was shooting, If you yeah, were shooting, yeah. yeah. And these are just guys who are just creeps to you, guys who are abusive, guys who do things in the scene that, that aren't discussed before time, before ahead of time, rather. Yes. Or guys that have wood problems or guys that talk too much on set. And then you're like, Guys oh my that God, talk too much are on your no list? You're killing me. Yeah, because they'll like be in your face when you're in the makeup chair and you're like, oh my God, you're grinding me and I have to deal with you. Like, Ugh. you know, it's a turn off. So yeah. there were a lot of reasons. But Tony, he and I remained really good friends. And he later shot me for his own company we, we always stayed friends but he's like respected me because I knew my limits I right. knew that that just wasn't what I was into and I wanted to explore my sexuality in the business I wanted to enjoy the sex right. I didn't want to be afraid of people so I just started to let people know like hey these are my boundaries and we would have these consent conversations before I learned a big lesson on that set yeah. was to have a consent conversation before every scene is that something you did throughout your career Whole after? career Yep. Interesting. And guys that knew me got used to me and knew what my things were. Yep. But, you know, I, I would just tap your leg twice if something wasn't comfortable or if I wanted to stop so we don't have to look at the camera yeah. and cause that. But it was mainly about are they too aggressive? Um, there's a couple of things I don't really like. I don't really like people touching my face, especially when they have lube on their hands or anything like right. that. So it was always kind of like they had a lot of little things. So what was it, so after you leave that scene, was there like it sounds like you were like this is something you had built up to. You had yeah. you had done the dancing, you were, you now finally did your first scene. You finish up, you hop in the car, you're driving down the driveway. What's going through your head? Was there an, oh, fuck, I can't believe I just did that moment? Was there a, that was awesome, I want to do it again moment? It was a, that was awesome, I want to yeah. do it again. I loved the whole energy of it. I loved yep. everybody on set. Everybody was just so nice. I mean, the porn industry in the 90s was just this really cool people, hella creative people who were just kind of a little rebellious, you know, wanted right. to do something against the grain. And they all had that in common. But they also really celebrated women. So you, you know, I'm not saying I wanted my ass kissed, but everyone there wanted the woman to look the best. The lighting guy wanted the woman to look the best. Right. The makeup girl, the wardrobe girl, everybody just catered to you. And I just loved how I felt. Like I was like, oh, I was such an important part of the day. I feel like now it's more like in porn, women getting like smacked oh, around. Oh, it's so different. Shit. It's, it's so, brutal, which so is something different. that you advocate against. Which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit because I find that super interesting. I watched. Did you find the name of the performer? Because I, I know so I gotta bad. find it. But um, okay, so you leave that. You did, and then you actually left the industry in 1997 because. So you're doing porn 94 to 97. You find some success. Obviously, you're a kept girl. You have a contract. You're doing all this. You leave the industry in 1997 and you go back to dancing. Mm -hmm. That was because there was an AIDS scare. Yes. And there's a great documentary called Porndemic uh, that is about that AIDS scare. And that AIDS scare took place over a period of almost a full year from one performer testing positive, a female, to another performer testing positive, to another. Once it got to six for me, I was like, there's a male performer in this business that's HIV positive, and we just don't know who it is. Did he know, do you think? Did you he, find out after the fact? You'll watch the documentary. Oh. He knew the whole time. You're kidding me. And so I'll tell you how it worked then. You went into this one clinic. This one clinic gave you your results on paperwork. So what these guys were smart enough to do is if sometimes they were just too lazy to go retest. And you only had to retest once every couple of months back then. But they would wait it out and they'd copy it on a copier machine. They'd find a way to doctor their test. They'd fold it up a bunch of times and put it in their pocket when you, they showed it to you. You, well, you couldn't really read it. Any, or they'd say, oh, I washed it in my jeans last night. I'm so sorry. So I wasn't comfortable making a return till 2005 because we established a system on the internet where you could see verified tests. Interesting. So you, after that, you had made ways because you said you only want to fuck with a condom. Yeah. And that was a big deal back then. Yeah, nobody would do it. Except for you. And you got work doing that? Uh, no, I did not get work doing that. Nobody wanted to work with a condom. I mean, it was just, hey, there's a million girls coming into this business all the time who will do it without. So Who was the guy? Can we just say who was the guy who, I mean, his status is obviously open It was Mark now. Wallace. Mark yeah. Wallace. And he, kno he knew and he was knowingly infecting people with HIV. Mm -hmm. Is he around still? He's not in the business, of course. Yep. Um, he is around. He's in this documentary. They interview him. Was he criminally charged? Uh, I think he was in one or two of the cases. It was very different back then because it was still 
uh, a felony. Now, they made it a misdemeanor in California. It's now only a $25 fine if you give somebody HIV and you knew you had it. $25? How is that possible? I agree with you. I feel like that that's just in California, yep. though, because I feel like in other places, if other states, if you give someone HIV knowingly, that's a fel that's like well, they're prison time. They've now labeled HIV in the state of California as a disability. So it's even harder to ask somebody if they have HIV and not cross that line. So this testing, being able to see yeah. green, go, this person's test is good, or red, they even haven't tested or it's not a good test, then you just don't work with that person. Do, is PrEP big in the porn industry? PrEP is big in the porn industry, and it's interesting you say that because because of PrEP, before I left the industry this last time, I fought for us to be double layering the HIV testing because when someone is medicating, their viral load can go below the catchable level in our system. Yeah, and because you're no longer allowed in California to ask because it's a disability, they had to change the forms at the law at the place where you fill out your forms. What's go get that tested. mean, double layering? So now we'll do like the Elijah Blot and uh, the other test that we'd been okay. using because one will show any percentage, uh, but it's not as accurate, right, yeah. for other things. So now we needed both to be sure that you're drawing the blood and you're looking at the blood in two different ways. If someone is medicating properly, their viral load goes down enough that it doesn't show in their records at all. And I still think performers should have the choice to know because – in a lot of gay porn, they'll pair up HIV-positive performers with each yeah. other, and it works perfectly fine. But I think on a regular set, there should be some awareness, and a girl is no longer allowed to ask a guy. A guy is no longer allowed to ask that's a That's fucked girl. up. That's California like a wrench. That's really like a threw a wrench at us yeah, with that one. That's just like red tape fucking things it is. up because it is. you want to appease whatever and not to ask. That's interesting, though. I've always wondered in gay porn how many people... Are, I mean, I'm sure if they're getting tested all the time, it's different now and everyone's on PrEP. But, like, if there are HIV-positive people, if they're going to work with people who aren't HIV-positive. They're so methodical about it yeah. on that end of the business. It's impressive. Yeah. Um, and they're all completely prepared. Now, some still – they're still using condoms on some productions as well. Yeah. They do test regularly. PrEP has been suggested for talent in the industry, but the problem with PrEP is if you're going to have multiple partners, it can put you at risk because it lowers your immune system. PrEP uh, is great okay. if you're in a relationship uh, because you're sharing the same pH, you're sharing the same right. germs, and eventually your immune systems will, your antibodies will be kind of the right. same. But if you are going to go out having sex on set with 20 different people in a month, then you're easily more susceptible to gonorrhea, syphilis, yeah. you know, hepatitis, everything And that's else. a thing that happens in the gay community too is, oh, I'm on PrEP, let's not use a condom. But then it's like, okay – First, it's like okay, but then it's like, but it's like okay. Well, what else do you have? You know exactly. what I mean? I'm in, I'm in, I'm at risk for gonorrhea, chlamydia, all this other shit. Right. But it's like as long as you don't get the big one. Right. That's what people care about, I guess. Right. But it's still a, it's it's just like young young women going on the pill. I'm like, right. Maybe we shouldn't put them on the pill because when you're young and you're on the pill, you don't use a condom. Right. And really, if you got in the habit of using the condom, you'd probably be better off. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. So you danced from, or so you took time off in 1997. You didn't get back into the business until, until 2005. Until 2005. In that time, you were featured dancing all across the country. You used your fame to kind of parlay this success. Awesome. And, and is that what you consider like, obviously, we'll get to it, Nail and Palin in 2008. Is that what you consider like the happiest time of your career? when you were going around dancing around the country? Because there were some nightmare stories. Oh, the road can be crazy. Yeah. Uh, it's a good balance because um, I've had a ton of fun on set, too. Yeah. You know, when you start to build your set, especially when I was producing my own movies, when I'm producing my own movies, I'm hiring the photographer I love, the camera mm. guy I love, the makeup artist I love. So, like, my favorite ten people are in the same place, and then me right. and... I'm going to have sex. Like, you know, so there's just a win-win. But the road was great because I got to see almost every single state in the United States. Damn. You know, I got to go almost every zoo, tons of ballparks, tons of arenas, tons of stadiums. Um, every butterfly sanctuary in the United States I've been to. Yeah, every you're a butterfly zoo. Sanctuary and I person? love butterflies. Here's a butterfly right here. Oh, yeah, you got it on the I necklace. Got it. But one thing that did happen during that break was I met my husband. Okay. So that was after that break. During that break, I went on the road. I met my husband, uh, fell in love. Uh, we dated for four or five years before we got married. Where did you meet? We met at a club. He was my bouncer that picked me up. You're kidding. And he was so cute. I mean, big blue eyes, great smile. He just could light up a room. We're still friends. Um, but I remember it was very specific. It was a Monday night. And there was a Monday night game, and it was the Niners Cowboys. And I was wearing my Cowboys jersey, and the and the driver pulls up, Mike, and he's wearing <laughs> his Niners jersey. And I was kind of going through a little phase where I was a little bit of a dick. 
And so I called the club and I was like, I'm not getting the fucking car with this guy if he's wearing a Niners jersey. Like, you, you know how I feel are about you this, kidding? right? So, so they're like, call him, take the jersey You're off. being a diva. I totally love it. being a diva about my sports shit. Yeah. And then um, there was an incident that took place that's in my book when we were driving home from the club that night. And uh, from that point forward, we hung out every single night. Yeah, that's great. And you guys, um, and that was on a Monday night in what state? Uh, that was in Pompano Beach, Florida. Pompano Beach, Florida. Such a so cute area. And the hotel was right on the intercoastal. And I remember I loved dancing at that club because you always had a patio that looked out at the water and there was a pool. I mean, traveling and having people pay for your hotel, That's there's amazing. something exciting about that. Absolutely. I loved it. That's the best. A little bit different, but I <laughs> but I went on uh, the Natty Tour with Barstool Sports. A <laughs> little bit different from what you did. But when you were traveling around, did you – It was you were just on the road. It was one city to the next city to the next city. Who booked it? Was it, You had a manager booking it? I had an agent booking that, and I would book my travel. Now, my first two years on the road, I didn't wasn't popular enough yet to get flights, so I had to drive. Yep. So I had a friend in Pennsylvania who, it's funny, we were just talking this morning. His name's Sledge. He used to be a roadie for a band. Sledge and as a roadie, Sledge, shocker. Yeah. Sledge used to come into the club, and I knew him really well, and so when I was getting ready to go out to L.A., I was like, yo, you know, you want to live at my place and take care of my stuff while I'm gone. Because I wasn't sure yet if I was going to move to California right. full time. So I still kept a place in Pennsylvania for a little bit. And then when opportunity presented, I'm like, you want to go on the road, dude? And we went. It was great. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke weed. So he was always like always making sure he took care of me. And my weed, and we traveled with this big <laughs> bong in the back seat. You travel with a bong, <laughs> Kareem Abdul Jabong. The bong was as tall as me, and Sledge would have to sit on the floor and light it. And he'd fill it with ice. He'd go to the ice machine at the hotel first. He'd fill it with ice for me. Like nothing was better than when you first go on the road and you're driving and you stay at shit hotels. Because when you stay at outdoor entrance shit hotels, you have no qualms about inviting everybody from the club back to your room. Who cares? Right. It's a truck stop hotel. Nobody's going to be <laughs> offended by the smoke of this marijuana. We're going to leave the door open. So we traveled with that. We traveled with that bong for two, three years. And then when I was finally Kareem Abdul up, 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 upgraded, we were making the last trip in San Fran. We had to drive the vehicle all the way back to Pennsylvania. And I said, you know what? I'm going to leave this bong with the DJ in San Fran. I know he's going to take good care of it. You think it's still around? Still around. I reconnected with the bong like three years ago. You're, you're kidding still me. Still around. Do you smoke weed still? I do. That's like you're, you don't drink, but you smoke? I'm not a good drinker. I don't yeah. really like drinking. Like if I drink, I try to be very conscious of like, okay, I have to have a full glass of water, a full glass. I think it's because I eat a plant-based diet yep. and I live so clean that because I'll go out with friends and maybe drink once a month it's too much like i don't like how it controls me and makes me feel sluggish you drink? only tequila only tequila <laughs> so i stopped drinking tequila years ago did so you told the story i just don't like the after feeling the next it's morning it's a nightmare drinking is a nightmare it is a, and i don't like what it does to my skin and i remember looking at girls in clubs so this was great when i was 16 17 18 you know remember i'm working in clubs when i couldn't drink alcohol and everybody knew they they weren't going to give me alcohol as a minor that's not what yeah. they were going to do so I got to really learn how to work without drinking. And I never drank as a feature dancer. Never drank on the road. Never. And, you know, that's where you make you money. But what, yeah. what, what was interesting was I was a young girl and I'd watch the chicks just turn into a fucking shit show by like 11. And the bars in North Jersey and Philly were open till 2 a.m. Literally all the money on the floor from 1130 midnight till 2 a.m. was mine. Because they were all trashed. So I looked at it as, you know... This is my moment. These girls yeah, are you wasted. Were sober. I'm you were sober. Making money. I'm going to yeah. make money right now. And everybody else in the club is wasted, so they're more generous. Like, this is all. So I learned how ugly alcohol could make you. And there's nothing more disgusting than a fucking drunk stripper. Like, a drunk woman <laughs> has nothing on a drunk stripper. Did you, was there a bunch of coke in the in strip clubs back then? There was. There was, a, I can't remember. 80, I feel like 80, <laughs> like, there is now. It was like, I went to, I can't remember, like, Sapphires randomly with, like, Glenny Balls. <laughs> Like back in the day, de- this might have been like three or four years ago, and it was like people were just obviously doing coke. So yeah. in the 80s, it must have been all over. Well, it was all over. Uh, there were a lot of drugs and guns and cash moving in and out of locations with strange men on a regular basis. Like yeah. if you were visiting the manager in the office and your conversation was too long, you knew you saw shit you should you shouldn't see. Like Did- you were just like, okay, I don't know you. Do not acknowledge me. You don't. And I went by Sunshine, so nobody even knew my real name was. Your Lisa. stripper name was Sunshine. Yes, I love that. That was my stripper name. So you did all. Uh, wait. I have to ask you about this story because you talked about it on Barstool Breakfast. 
you had said it might have been in 2014 you were dancing and someone tried to rob you and your bouncer held them and you ended up beating Being the shit dirt, out of them. Naked. Can you tell naked? Naked. Can you tell that story? Naked. Uh, it was in Madison, Wisconsin at Silk, which is a beautiful club out in the middle of nowhere. And these young kids were drinking, kind of day drinking all day. Uh, so they were just obnoxious. And by the time I got on stage, the one kid just started heckling me. You're an old grandma. You're disgusting. You're this. And I'm just like. Mm. How old was this kid? Probably 21, 22. You know, a little oh, white entitled fucker. Little white little entitled little drunk boy. Yeah. They didn't know what yeah, Lisa Ann had know. planned. So he kept at me, and so it's a T stage where there's like a runway, and then there's two arms, right? Yep. So I dance down by where I'm at security. He stays by the steps so that nobody goes up the steps on the stage. And I remember saying to him, like, yo, I'm going to dance over there. If, if you see a fucking problem, you better be ready because that kid over there is giving me a problem. Then I go dance. You know, I would always tell him, like, <laughs> who's annoying me? Like, as I'm dancing, I'd be telling him, like, yo, that guy's going to get a kick in the fucking face. You <laughs> um, and so, you know, next thing you know, I turn around. And the kid had reached onto the stage and grabbed my bag. And I had a bag. I would give away DVDs. I would give away posters. Yeah. I had a towel in there, a water. And he grabbed my bag. And he started just taking my posters and, like, ripping my posters. And I don't know what ripping happened. Ripping them? Yeah, just like just twisting them and tearing yeah. them, disposing of them, and just throwing them on the floor. I don't know what came over me other than the fact that I was burned out. I needed to retire. I had done too many weekends on the road because my last couple of years, I was like, let's just try to go between 48 and 50 weekends a year yeah. for like the last three, just to save money. I mean, that's a lot of weekends. It's a lot of weekends. Yeah. And luckily, when you're making more money, you do shorter weeks. So some clubs only have you Friday and Saturday. Some right. clubs have you Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But so I went over there. I had on thigh high latex boots and nothing else and I jumped off the stage onto this kid's chair as I jump onto his chair my bouncer's already there and I'm like hold this motherfucker back and I just start pummeling him <laughs> like every man before him that irritated me in the past six months got it and then I got to the point where I saw a bottle and I picked up the bottle Oh, no. And that was where my bouncer was like, fuck that. You were going to bottle this motherfucker. I was going to, and that was too much. I, I, I regretted it. Listen, I've had. <laughs> this was also like relatively recent. Yeah, 2014. Like, I really had to work through. And that's when I I, look, I went to everybody in my life, and I'm like, I need to get off the road. This is becoming too that much. That was the for me. final straw. It was straw. a turning point. I remember going back in that room in the office, and we broke into where they. They had the tape from recording on the stage because I didn't want this guy. Police are coming. This guy's all banged up in the face. I'm kicking him in the balls with my boots <laughs> while I'm beating him. But as soon as I picked up the bottle, my bouncer dropped his arms, reached over, picked me up, just picked me up, and took me back to the dressing room. Like, that was over. Because he it. knew. He's like, I would never let you do that. That's incredible. And that tape does not exist. Does anyway. not exist. So don't even try and look don't for it. Don't even try. I have everyone, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> everyone listening But I will right blame now. the bouncers who didn't see anything happening because that the bouncers use the time when the feature's on stage to try and flirt with house girls. Like, dude, <laughs> you know, and I would, and I see them all and they're all like talking to a girl. And I'm like, well, this is a fucking free for all, man. I'm going for it with this punk. So Did you have like, because sir, <laughs> I'm going for it with this punk. I would love to know where that kid is right now. I've, 22 uh, years old. Like, I've beaten quite a few dudes. I'm trying to. Th I probably <laughs> beat a hundred dudes with my fists. You're kidding me. No. A hundred dudes with your fists? Easily. I am the queen of the fucking thumb to the throat till you're not breathing, making you apologize with my other fan. My other hand just, just fingering in your face like, why are you acting like that? What did your mother do to you? What is your problem? You need to seek help. Stop being such an ass. Not the stepmother that they expect. <laughs> not they at all. When guys ask me on the internet if I was, uh, will you be my stepmom? I'm like, I'd love to have you do all my laundry, do <laughs> all the dishes, wash everything, clean the neighbor's apartment. You would be hating me. Um, that's incredible. So... That was in 2014. We're going to bring it back to you gotten back into the business in 2005. In 2008 was when things exploded for you yeah. with Nail and Palin. I'm a gay guy, obviously, so this stuff, anything like hetero porn is not even on my radar. Right. Like, I don't know. Like, but I even brought when, in that <laughs> gap with that project exactly. because Exactly. So you, Palin. you brought in that gap, and I remember being like, Nail and Palin, what is going on around here? I, I think I just graduated high school. It was my freshman year of college. So young. And, I, and I was like, Nail and Palin. And so I looked, and I was like, that is Sarah Palin. When you were filming that scene and when you initially got pitched that project, did you know – oh, shit, this is going to be huge? Or no. was it just kind of a throwaway? Oh, that was fun. Let me throw it away. When I, I save all of my handwritten planners every year. When I was going through to write my first book, I looked at the date. It was like October 15th where we shot the first Palin scene, and I wrote Hustler scene. That's how little I thought about it. I just wrote Hustler scene. Like So that showed me right away. I didn't see it. Also, 
I didn't see it because I wasn't really following Palin. Now, mind you, the day I got the call was actually the day of the very first VP debate. Oh my God, so I went so home that night, that's and so I was like on the floor right in front of the TV. If you recall, she had a black shiny suit yeah. on, and she just kind of sashayed out there. And I was like, "Oh, I get it. Like I can, <laughs> I can see why Larry Flint wants to take part in this. This is fantastic." That this was who woman, pitched you, Larry yes. Flint, the great Larry the great Flint. Great Larry Flint, rest in peace. He one of my p- favorite people. He pitched you on that, mm-hmm. and at, you watched the VB debate. You took the job. Oh, yeah. How much time went from after the VP debate to when you took the job to when it came out? Because you had to jump on the moment, We right? had to jump on it because somebody from Hustler leaked the story. So, like, the next day they came to me and they like, okay, we got to shoot it right away. We got to shoot it in the next week. And I'm like, well, I knew a couple of things. I knew I was going to need wardrobe, and there would be no way that I could trust a tailor – to adapt these clothing, these skirts shorter, the blazers yeah. tighter, the booby stuff. I couldn't do that. So I knew I had to go. And I remember exactly where I was. I had traveled to a trade show in New Jersey. And by the time I landed, they're like, you got to fucking get your wardrobe together. Like right now, we got to get this plan. We're going to do it like next week. And I'm like, oh this my Jersey, God. Said? Yeah. And they actually had TMZ come and shoot me for my first time in Jersey outside of that trade show to talk about this, talk about Palin. So I remember being in my hotel room that night, those nights, every day after the trade shows, and I just order all these suits, all these suits, because Macy's will get you your shit the fastest. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to go Macy's. And then I sewed them all myself. So I do have a sewing machine. I do know how to sew. And I, <laughs> You're a seamstress. I, I'm a seamstress. A lady of many talents. I, I altered all the skirts. Like they went from like regular skirt to like just this skirt. <laughs> um, and I had in no time a dozen suits to choose from that Larry would love. You picked your own. So Larry had final say on the wardrobe. Was Larry very involved in, in uh, like scenes that he knew were going to be big? Or were there certain ones where he was like, oh, do this? But because you had a relationship with him, I'm sure he was more involved and you trust his judgment and all that he actually trusted my judgment the wardrobe team reached out to me and said oh we'll buy you some suits and I'm like what's the budget and they, they told me what the budget was and I said hell no am I wearing anything within that budget do and you remember what it was it was like $500 yeah. and I knew that I couldn't buy decent so I wanted to have some Tahari suits this is Sarah Palin like I was yeah. googling what suits she wore what designers were making spin off you did your spin-off. research yeah and I was like can't go cheap on this and I also had a great relationship with Larry Flint so he trusted me and I knew I would do it right. I spent more on my suits than I made to shoot the whole Palin movie. Really? Yeah. And after, it was a complete loss. It was. <laughs> but it was wait, so hold worth on, it. Hold on. The Palin movie it. was a complete loss. I made no money shooting that movie. I spent more money on wardrobe than my paycheck for the movie. But then you had to have gotten residual income from. No, it, you right? don't get residuals from porn unless you own it. When I'm the producer. With this content that I own, I get residuals. But for anything, but I was also, by the time we shot it, now mind you, this all happened in a week. But in that week, I was doing interviews every day about a movie I hadn't even shot yet. Like, wow. I, So I was like, this is going to be big. Spend any amount of money because this is going to be big and you're going to be proud that the fact that they told me Entertainment Tonight was going to be on set and TMZ was going to be on set. And this was the first time mainstream press was ever yeah. coming into a room during an actual sex scene ever. So I was like, I have to have the best laundry. I remember, I got home, go to Macy's, buy as much laundry as possible, go check out Nordstrom. Like, it was frantic, but I was glad that I spent all that money because I used those suits later on on the road, right. feature dancing as Sarah Palin. Oh, I wow. used them for personal appearances. I made it work, but it was the right thing to do to show Larry, like, I'm doing this right because this is going to be a banger. Were they, when you say they were on set, they weren't like watching they you. They were. They were watching you fuck TMZ yeah. and yep. Inside Edition, all these people. All these people. And I That's remember so was it. So you were just fucking in front. How many people were you fucking in front of? That day, and it was a small room, and it was a hot set, and you just feel everyone breathing on you because you're up against it. It's you know, be you're so against the wall. I am an audience person, yeah. so from dancing you and doing on. all the things, I was like, yeah. "This is." F-. And I also, in my twisted mind, was like, "I wonder how many people do want to be here or don't want to be here." Like, I wonder how many of these people got this thing from their boss, and they thought. This is like the cat fashion show in yeah. fucking, you know. <laughs> I know what you're, what's the, what is it? Uh, in San Diego, Anchorman. Anchorman, that's right. This is like the cat fashion show. But then I was thinking, I wonder how many other people are like, you know, when you're in the business, you don't get a boner as a dude. This is what you do for a living. But I was like, are any of these dudes going to get a boner? Like in yeah. my mind, I had so you're much. You're a performer. Go, but there were probably 65, 70 people on set that day watching and reporting on that movie. My God, that's it was intense. Insane. And it was really intense. You're having sex in front of 65, 70 people, and you, you obviously that was huge. You use that yeah. to parlay into yeah. a ton of other work. So that's from, why I stayed out on the road till 2014. So you were able to use the nail and palin to just really like 
get a ton of other work, make a ton of other money. And then what eventually led you to retire again? And you retired in... 2014. In 2014. Yeah, after the incident. The incident. <laughs> the strip club incident. Where I oh, that's there. the incident that did it. I was going to say, was there like one thing that made you realize like, fuck, I got to get out of this? Or was it just like, listen, I've made my money Let's just call it and let's explore. There was other a couple options. of things. I did okay. have a financial number that I wanted to reach, and I was reaching that that year. You know, I have to ask you what that number is. Uh, the, the number was to save a million dollars cash. Okay, that was just all the right. Number. So, um, and it's funny because nobody's ever asked me that number before. It's um, funny the microphone gives you an excuse to ask anything. You want. <laughs> so true. But that was really like, okay, yeah. make sure you're liquid and savings and no debt and you yeah. know those things. And my home was almost paid off. All of those like little things, but. I will say that after I got popular from Palin, it wasn't as fun being in the business. People become very competitive with you when you're doing well. Yeah. And so I felt with my peers, it wasn't, I was better off in a neutral zone where I didn't really bother anybody. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. too popular. And so I felt this like at trade shows and other events, it wasn't as fun for me anymore. People were different towards me and people started to cackle behind my back. There were girls that would go on the road and they would know I was coming to a club the week after them. And they would tell the club owner, you should probably hit her up and ask her for some current photos. She looks like shit. Like, You're kidding me. And these club, these club owners out of panic would like call me and expect me to like stop my life. Like, can you get naked right now and take photos for us? Yeah. We need to know that this is what you look like right now. And it just became like, and I was like, okay, you know, I have to do this, right? Yeah. So it just became not as fun, you know, and the road changed. You know, when I first started on the road, no club was open later than two. My last couple years on the right. road, clubs are open till 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's a long They'd day. They'd hit me up, and they'd be like, oh, your first show's at 1 a.m. Like, how am I supposed to get it together? Like, you right. have to kind of take a weird nap. <laughs> I'm and an adult. And then hamp yourself up at midnight yeah. and then go into this club. And it's like, also, I didn't feel there was as much money to be made between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. as there used to be between 7 p.m. at midnight. Yeah. So I felt like I was Everyone's kind of running away. Everyone shit-faced. And nobody yeah. wants to carry a DVD. Nobody right. wants to purchase anything That's right. you from were you. DVDs. Fuck yeah, yeah. And you were giving them out. So yeah, but I would sell them after my shows too. And I will say this: my first gigs, my first six months after Palin came out, it was the craziest thing on the road. I mean, everyone stood up for a photo and a DVD, and everyone wanted the Palin DVD. I couldn't carry enough DVDs. I would have anywhere from two to three hundred DVDs shipped to each appearance, and I would never come home with any. Really. That's fucking insane. And so you rode that wave uh -huh. until 2014. You hit your financial number, yep. and you said, it's time to make a change. You yep. said, listen, I love." you wrote a book. Yep. You said, I love sports. I Plus, 2013, I signed my first contract with Sirius. That's right. And my gig was, if they re-signed me in 2014, I would start to look at this as a real serious option for my life. When I got my new contract August of 2014, Everything was kind of landing where I was like, all signs are pointing to. Yeah. It's time for you to try something new. And you've been there for a while. So you've been there consistently mm -hmm. since 2014. And I 2013. Find, 2013, excuse me. And I find that so rare to have people get out of the business because it is so all-encompassing. Um, and have and a the money is so intoxicating. Oh, I'm sure. It sucks to not have a garbage bag of cash in every room. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> I'm sure. But to be able to successfully parlay a career – um, into something different is just so impressive. And then, but you also kept kind of a foothold in the industry because you would mentor yeah. girls who were coming in. Can you talk a yep. little bit about why you did that? Because I, I felt very lucky to get into the business. And I can remember car rides with Peter Davey and he would just go through these lists of things. Like, remember, Lisa, you never have to do anything you don't want to do. Always feel comfortable. If you're sick, let people know because we don't want to pass around germs on sets. Take care of your... Yep. And now there's nobody having those conversations. So I just think it's really important. I also want the young women and men in the industry to know that what they put out there definitely comes back. Like if I could do an ad for porn, it would be like a pharmaceutical ad. And I'd be giving a disclaimer at the end of all the shit that kind of comes along with it, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you're not going to save your money and if you're not going to have a purpose, this is really going to follow you and it's going to make it more difficult to just jump into other things, right? So you have to really be thinking about it. It's not just you can't willy-nilly it anymore because you're on the internet and those scenes are not coming down. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And then – You've also spoken like at length about, which is what I found so interesting, is at length about the problem with porn, like the porn problem, you call it, the intimacy issues it creates with young kids, 
the consent issues it creates. Um, and you've done some, some like touring and yeah. talking about that. Can you talk a little about that and like what, what you're doing, what the porn, what is the, let's start with this. What is the porn problem according to Lisa Ann? This is something I'm really passionate about. The porn problem is the aggressiveness, the tone that's changed. Now before the internet, we had to worry about distribution and distribution in the United States was different in every state. So we kept the scenes very vanilla so that you wouldn't run into a situation where you sent VHS tapes to Florida and the Bible Belt and there was fingering that was more than one right. finger, right? That's an actual you, it thing? It was a thing. In the 90s, it was a thing. You they could only have rules. one finger in, your thumb had to be visible, other hand had to be out. They had a ton of rules. There could be no strangling in the Bible Belt state. So what this actually did from having a distribution situation, a liability, like I had friends that went to jail because somebody sent DVDs to the wrong state. You're going to jail for that as a producer. What do you mean? You if you send DVDs to the wrong state and the DVD includes something that, that is, is not, not legal, that is not legal they will jail, jail you for that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And this is, I had no idea, but anyway, I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt you, this, but no, go on. This is a real thing. Yeah. Uh, and then when the internet happened, everybody realized, oh, we have no more restrictions. We can do whatever we want. Well, what I didn't realize was everybody was pretty bored with doing what they were already doing. So now they're like, let's see if we can do rape scenes. Let's see if we can do violent scenes. Let's see if we can do aggressive scenes. Let's do DPs all the time. Let's do double anal. And what we did was we just upped the ante and up the ante. And the porn problem is we don't have it re re labeled like, let's see video games. Yep. Or movies. You get PG, you get PG-13, you get R. These movies are not labeled or identified. So if you're an 11-year-old and you get your first iPhone and you decide to go on the Internet, first place you're going to go is to find something to masturbate to. What if your very first scene is something that is graphic and violent and, and the girl looks to be against her will? You're conditioned to believe that's sexual. You have now been taught a message. Even though you don't really know how to process that message, you have something in your head that's a porn problem. It's and like it's, starting with heroin. It's it's like starting with heroin. And we don't talk about it. You know, we don't even offer sex ed in every state in the United States. As a matter of fact, only half of the states in the United States offer sexual education in school. So I'm kind of a proponent right now to try to offer porn education in schools. Yeah. Because I think young people should know that we're paid, that we have consent forms and consent yep. conversations, that we're tested regularly, and that we can even ask to have a second test done if we'd like to. I want to lay out for them what's actually going on so that I can answer questions with their misconceptions because, as you see, younger people are having less sex than ever. There's This is the lowest teen pregnancies ever Why do you been. think that is? Because young men are afraid to have sex because of what they've watched in porn. and it's Afraid to have sex because they of are. what they watched. They are afraid they're not big enough, afraid they're not good enough, uh, don't know how to do it. Um, they think that every girl should do what the women are doing in porn, so they've had some bad experiences where they choked a girl and she smacked them. Or we've seen quite a few strangulation deaths over the past five years in the United States to teenagers who are having aggressive sex. The girl lets the guy do it. We're taught how to strangle on set so you don't cut off air supply. Young people don't know that. There was a kid last Halloween in New Jersey, and he was having sex with a girl in the back of his car, and he strangled her to death, and then he panicked and didn't know what to do. So by the time he could get her help, she died. Jesus this is a teenager, Christ. but this is from porn. This isn't from their parents aren't telling him to do this. A magazine isn't showing them to do this. This is what they're watching. Have you received flack from the industry for advocating against it? You're not at, so I'll be clear. I don't think you're advocating against it and I don't want to put words in your you're mouth. You're right though. I have. But you're you're advocating for a change in the industry. I'm advocating for two things. The messaging to be more clear about okay. what type of content is out there and possibly maybe some of that more aggressive content should stay behind an, uh, a pay gate. Yep. You know, where it's not on Pornhub and it's not free for a young viewer. Maybe that would be something that would be smart. I mean, there is one guy that makes a sick ton of money who has a really aggressive site. Um, it's called facial abuse. And it's blowjob scenes where he beats the fuck out of the girls. And I had... A young girl that I knew did the scene. I didn't know she was doing the scene, but she got picked up at the airport. The cops took her into the back. They wouldn't let her fly home from the gig because she was so strangled, and they wanted to know what happened to her. 
That's that's insane. But when you say it's like d- more messaging, how does that messaging get rolled out? Because if it's just a box on a website, right. like you have now, you are so right. eighteen plus. Yeah. So what do you say in the box? A girl might be strangled in this scene. Or it like wouldn't be a bad idea to put a disclaimer in front of every scene, even right. on Twitter. Like Twitter is the worst. Twitter is porn. Twitter is the worst distributor of illegal content because Twitter has no age gate, and what Twitter is doing is it's feeding porn not only to minors, but it's feeding porn to countries that don't get porn. Yep. Remember, where I just was in Turkey, the Islamic countries, they have a block on porn. And so when I met with people there, the first thing I did was, let's go to my Twitter and let you show, look at my Twitter feed. I'm going to show you these girls. Like, well, how can you see porn? You're, we're here. I'm like, that's what your kids are looking at. You yeah. believe the government is blocking it properly, but Twitter is a gateway that's letting them get in. There's so many other ways they can be doing it. Now, the other side of the message is this. Parents need to be more aware when they give a young person a phone, what they could be stepping into on the internet. They have no idea. They don't. No idea. But yet they wouldn't let their kid walk out in New York City and not ask where are you going, what time are you coming back, don't cross the street without looking. They wouldn't do that. But the internet is even worse than that. The internet has predators looking to talk to young kids. Yeah. But let me ask you this then. So now that OnlyFans is going on, so say studio porn is more aggressive and there's the choking, there's this and that. If for OnlyFans porn, if it's more amateur, is that working to reverse the problem that you're talking about? If it's just some girl masturbating on there, or it's a girl and a guy having consensual sex, or a guy and a guy having consensual sex, is that like the natural ebb and flow of the industry, or do you think it's too, we're too far into the problem for, for that to correct it? I, what I'm hearing from talent who's doing so well on their OnlyFans, which I'm so proud of them because it's made them just, just such good young entrepreneurs. They're yeah. scheduling their live shows. Yep. They're uploading their content. You have an OnlyFans. The, I do. I recycle all the yep. content that I own on it, and it's a fantastic way to go through the library of my sexual life for me. <laughs> um, but what I'm seeing is – the companies that would like bait and switch things like you brought up earlier, like what if you get on set and somebody asks you like, hey, will you do this? Now I'm hearing my friends that are still in the industry say, I'm going to shoot again, but I'm never going to shoot for this company, this company, and this company. So I think the companies are going to see talent has more rights than ever because they've found a way to make their own money. Right. Do they when I – always, I also found it interesting. This might be a dumb question. Like if you're producing – say you're contracted by someone yep. and you're making a movie – and then that movie gets uploaded to Pornhub for free, and anyone can watch it. You get it. fucked. How do you make money? You get fucked. And the problem with Pornhub being in Montreal is it's twice as expensive to send them a cease and desist because it's international law. So, like, you can spend $1,500 all day long sending cease and desist for people stealing your content. Yeah. But if you want to do it there, it's international law. You have to file in court, and it's going to cost you about ten to fifteen grand. Jesus. And then they're just going to put it right back up again. So, you know, Pornhub definitely hurt the industry by stealing content that way. And that's because, like, everything is free on Pornhub. So you're saying that the only porn stars who make money are people who either, A, have OnlyFans, or B, are on a paid site. And I don't know one person who pays for a site. There are, well, look, they're paying for OnlyFans. That's kind of like them paying for a site. But the girls make good money doing other things, whether it's their pay for their scenes, whether Mm -hmm. it's appearances, feature dancing, uh, nightclub events, you know, all of those things. So there are other vehicles, and they can sell the clothes that they wore on set. You know, the girls have a lot of different streams of income to balance that out. That's interesting, selling the clothes. Kate wanted to sell her pregnancy panties. Okay. <laughs> she can go to My Sexy Auctions, which is an amazing site. This that, is a clip, th- by this the way. Is this is a clip. Going to Kate. Kate, you're going to love My Sexy Auctions. What you're going to love the most is really get in deep with the feet guys because they want to buy dirty socks. And it's the greatest thing ever when you're like cleaning out closets and you have a bag of clothes that you're like, oh, I should donate these. Oh, no, I could sell these. So there you go, Kate. Side hustle established. <laughs> you oh, no. I could <laughs> so, sell. I had a guy who used to no, Buy nothing, foot picks from me. nothing goes to waste. How much does a Lisa Ann foot pick go for? It all depends. You know, it all, all depends, depends on what you're asking. If, you, if, if, the guy if you're locking asked, your fingers the, in your toes, if the guy has asked me a hundred times by DM, I'm, I'm throwing it out there at 50 bucks. You know what I mean? 50 bucks? Yeah. Oh, you could charge way more than I 50 I could, but bucks. I don't want to be greedy. 20, I think, is fair. I'm not naked. It's just my feet. <laughs> um, but I think, I think the power is back in the talent's yeah. hands more than ever. Um, so I know you, you're busy. You've got to get out of here, but I do just want to ask you a couple more things. Um, 
what exactly did you do on your trip to Turkey? Because you had told us about this in the fall and it was top secret and it's something that you're passionate about. Turkey was an incredible trip. I got to go to Istanbul, which by the way is the only city that is connected by two continents. Ah. So you can go over to Asia on a bridge. Uh, and did I used, you do it? Yeah, because I nice. used the bin app where you put in everywhere you've been. Yeah, yeah. And it showed. So I was like, as soon as I was at the restaurant the first night, and I'm like, is that the bridge that connects Asia? Can we drive over there tomorrow? Because <laughs> I need to add it. And I won't add anything to my bin app unless I touch the soil there. Yeah. So I was invited by Durex to take part in the first ever sexual wellness, sexual health campaign of videos that they put on a YouTube site. Uh, Durex is really trying to promote condoms. They're trying to educate on consent, which is a large issue in Islamic culture. And they're also trying to educate women and men on their sexual health. There's no sex education there. It's actually illegal to talk to anyone about sex outside of the home. Huh. So a young person can't go to somebody else's house. Like my girlfriend who works for Durex, her son asked if he could take a box of the condoms to a friend's. And she said, no, I can't let you do that because if you go there, it's a crime against me because I let you take the condoms there. It's parents' law only. That's fucking weird. So people don't f people do fuck over there. They're just super repressed, and the government isn't about it. They're super repressed. They're in denial. They're in denial that any porn is being seen. And what they're having is they're having a big issue with teen suicide. Teen suicide is normally from teen pregnancy. They're yeah. also having health issues with young women trying to do their own abortions. Like the oh tragedy that they're dealing with, and also, you know, the consent issue and the way men still look at women there. Uh, a lot of young women get pregnant. After you get pregnant, nobody's going to marry you in that culture. Yeah. So there's all these layers to this. But when I went there, they told me, please scrub your phone and your computer because if you have any adult images, you go through customs, they might not let you in wow. because porn is illegal there. So I'm like, okay, no problem. I'm used to doing that. When I, when I travel internationally, I delete all my shit because yeah. – I'm always it. profiled, and then the TSA agents like, let me look at your phone. They stare through your phone. If you have thousands of photos, they're going to be there for hours. Right. Um, so I went over there. It was a great trip. I was there for 10 days. We shot this really cool music video that is all about teaching people there that what you're seeing in porn is not real. Yep. You know, what, you know, they did a skit on Rocco that he was a plumber. <laughs> He's like, I don't plumb. I don't clean pools. But you they're, know? if they're not even watching porn, why do you have to do that? Because they are watching porn. It's they're getting sneaky. it through Twitter. They're getting it through different. Also, they have VPN boosters. They're, yeah. they're not dumb. These kids want to watch it. Um, so I did this series and also got to do some interviews and got to really talk about the sexual wellness issue that they're faced with. Right. Understanding that the country doesn't want that type of content in, they have two choices. They can either adapt and educate their young people to save them, to save them from mistakes or, or a crisis. Or they can go to Twitter and to OnlyFans and to everyone else and say, porn is blocked here and you're breaking our federal law. Um, that's their two options. Yeah. And I presented that to them of, do you realize how it's getting in? And I was very surprised that even people connected with the government did not know that it was on Twitter. Because obviously, if you're not following anybody, I just feel like every time I turn on Twitter, I see a gaping asshole. <laughs> but that's because I follow a bunch of the girls Same. in the business. Or yeah. randomly, your friend retweets something. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's Twitter, you know? Yeah. But, um, um, Keep scrolling. It's so fine. when I went, I had one sightseeing day, yeah. and they took us out on a boat to watch the sunset. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, and it was beautiful. Our last night there, out on a boat listening to music, and it was just beautiful. But I got to go to some mosques. I got to do some sightseeing. And they said, okay, no posting of your photos till you get home. Let's flash forward to January. I'm now promoting the music video. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to talk about it. I start putting things up on my page. The next thing you know, it happens. The government is getting flack from the um, the religious, the activists, the right? Yeah. yeah, that a I was in the country. I should not have been allowed in that country. That That's b it. I was at mosques and I should not have Ooh. been allowed to be. My Ooh. hair was covered. Oh, I was completely. Boy. So they said to the company, "This is going to be a problem for you. This is going to be a problem for her." What the situation for me would be? It's called a fatwa. And a fatwa is when the entire culture gets together and whoever gets the hit on you gets the hit on you. So that means they want you dead. What do you, you have a hit on you in Turkey? I would have had the fatwa if I didn't follow all of their rules and remove the photos oh my from God. my social media. And you know, when you try to take photos down, they're still embedded on the internet. Yeah, so you have sure. to do the real thorough search. Who else shared them? Yeah, who yeah. else reposted them? Yep. So I can remember getting the emergency calls at like 3 o'clock in the morning in you know, Turkish time. Every, my, my life was on a different time zone for quite some time doing business with these guys. And uh, they're like, yeah, this is a huge issue. We've sent you an email with all the photos that need to be 
deleted. I'm like, listen, I don't have a car in the city. Like, I quite often get into a taxi cab uh, or an Uber <laughs> and quite often could just be sitting in a fatwa situation. So clearly yeah. I'll do this. But the downside is this. I want to go back. I want to go back when it's open. You're banned now, though. And no I'm, I'm, I'm worried that now I'm yeah. banned. And that's the you real bummer. I, w- I maybe could go in through the Asia side and then drive over the bridge. Yeah, is it's what not I'm worth thinking. it, Lisa. Don't do it. I just loved it there. Can't the lose service you, Lisa. and the food was so good. Did you – you had security extensively yes. while you were there. Did yes. you ever feel unsafe? I didn't because I'll tell you it's – You guys had guns on them. Everyone has guns everywhere. And, you know, when you pull into your hotel, they do the whole wand under your vehicle to make sure there's no bombs. Oh, shit. Like, they don't play. You can't walk into a store, a mall, or your hotel without putting all of your bags through a screener like you're at the airport. Right. They don't play. So I felt safe, very, very safe there. But it was great to start this process. I do hope that they find a way to bring me back because I'd like to do this with dir- with Durex in different countries. And yeah. I'd like to come back to Turkey and I'd like them to uh, open their minds to me. Just I'm only there to try to protect young people and give them more information so they can avoid risk. That's the only reason I want to yep. do these things. I spoke at the Oxford Union 2019. I watched that. Uh, that and great. that was amazing. I got to meet Dr. Ruth. I love the I love the kid who was – I couldn't stop looking at this kid behind you who has just had this, like, dummy <laughs> look on his face the Loving entire – When time. you, like, broke from your speech at – I watched this last night. I'm not, like, watching all the time. <laughs> when uh, you broke from the speech at the end, and then you're like, oh, I got to tell you something. First of all, guys, you're big enough. <laughs> yes. It's the fish eye lens, and this kid was like uh, – Everyone watch it. It's Oxford Union, Lisa Ann. But it's it true. It's something that I tell young men all the time. I've been doing these cameo one-on-walk, one-on-one calls, and a large majority of, are, of young men ask me, does size really matter? Yeah. And this is letting me know how insecure they are about mm-hmm. their size. And I'm like, you know what matters? How well you communicate with a girl that likes you. That is the nicest thing to hear. <laughs> That's what <laughs> matters. True. But it it, is. But it's true. It's true. And I'm like, yeah. you know what I can give the best advice I can give you right now is to expand your mind and to, to read and learn some things so when you meet a girl you can have some really good yeah. conversation. I said, because believe me, your penis is the last thing on her mind. Interesting. And the size of it is not going to change how much she likes you. I love that so much. Well, Lisa, I am so glad that so you nice came to in. Sit here with you. This is great. I feel like we cover like a lot of the times when you come on radio, it's just like quick hits. Yeah. And I was like, no, I want to know like from childhood to Turkey, like what Lisa Ann is about, how she got to where she is. And you're doing awesome stuff. You're changing like the world, the way that people, you know, view intimacy and view porn yeah. and do all this. So I want to give men confidence again. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you are. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on. And Kate, the first Barstool baby, I'm super excited. And I'm going to um, adopt a child through blessings in a backpack in her daughter's name. So her, the, it's a boy or a girl? They it's boy. a boy, boy, Cassius. Cassius. So well, Cassius will be have made his first charitable donation. And he'll make sure a student gets full food for the whole school year in a backpack every weekend. Because we have a lot of food insecurity here in the United States. And it's something that I also am really active in. That's incredible. Thank you so much. It's my baby shower gift for everyone. I'm like, I know you wanted some real shit, but instead, (laughs) your kid just adopted a kid and made sure that kid could eat, and that's better. And they can't argue with it. No! Wait, so you're, and then just before we let you go, uh, Lisa Ann does fantasy, Sirius 210 XM 87, and that's on Sundays from 3 to 5 uh, p.m. and Mondays from 10 to 12 p.m. You got it. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you.